I definitely think that was the best episode of Perry Mason yet. And I'm really looking forward to the finale. I think that a lot of people who criticized this show in the early going, if they had stuck it out past, I'd say, the third episode, I think they would have really come to enjoy this show. And I think it's really hit its stride in the back half of the season, becoming better and better with every episode. I had feared that the courtroom drama would bog things down, but that has not proven to be the case at all. So before I get into my specific thoughts with spoilers, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. I'm going to be doing lots of upcoming reviews of shows, including uh, The Boys Season 2, Love Ca Lovecraft Country, and others. So if you're interested in seeing those reviews and other reviews on this channel, please consider subscribing. And if you give me a like, I'd really appreciate it. So getting into Perry Mason Chapter 7. I think that the strongest thing this episode by far was the relationship between Perry and Paul Drake. I was a little bit concerned that they would have an unnatural dynamic because I think that it would have been easy for this to feel forced, but that thankfully has not proven to be the case at all. They had some good earnest moments when Perry uh, is shared with Paul Drake about his father owning that land and his sadness at losing it after the revelation that Lupe has bought it because he failed to pay his taxes. I thought that they had great chemistry in the scenes where they were mining the material for a little bit more humor. I love this character. I love the way Chris Chalk is playing him. My wife is a big fan of the relationship between Paul Drake and his wife, and I am as well. I haven't really brought that up in previous episodes, but I think it's a wonderfully portrayed relationship. Uh, and this episode I particularly enjoyed, thought was funny, was the quip after Mason uh, was getting beat up by the, the pimps at the Asian brothel and Drake stepped in to save him. I thought that quip was particularly funny. And generally speaking, I just thought that the characters had good chemistry this episode, and I look forward to their continued interactions as they become more and more familiar with each other. They're off to a good start. I do find it interesting how they've kind of reversed the, or well, the way that the relationship was in the original series, because in the original series, you had the sense that Perry was the adult in the room, whereas here, I would say that Paul Drake comes off as more of the adult in the room than Perry. And it's interesting because this relationship between these two comes at the cost of Perry's relationship with Strickland, who suggests that Perry use Drake as his new investigator. And I've been thinking about this. I've theorized all season long that Strickland was going to be killed by Ennis any day now. And that could still happen, but I'm actually leaning against it happening now because I think that the purpose of Strickland as a character was to have him be a representative of the old Perry, who Perry was before. And as Perry cuts ties with him and moves on to this relationship with Drake, we're seeing him mature and become the Perry that we are used to seeing in the original series. And we see shades of this in the costuming uh, as Perry moves away from his mortuary outfits to a more dignified and distinguished look as he has at the trial this episode. And oh boy, was he a much, much better, smoother attorney this episode. And it was good that they showed him getting better throughout the episode, last episode. And clearly he's not arrived at the point that he's at in the original Perry Mason series, but clearly he's starting to get the hang of things. And my favorite moment in the trial by far was when he caught Maynard Baines off guard, Stephen Root's expression when he realized that Mason had played him were a sight to behold, uh, particularly in the scene where he was tricked into asking the witness about the evidence that Perry clearly already knew existed and was waiting to spring on him, but the realization that he had been ambushed by Mason and that perhaps he's underestimating his opponent, the way that Stephen Root played this scene was very, very funny to watch. 
and the scene in which he held the picture up to the jury of the Dodson baby and Mason objected or responded to his objection saying, and I don't see the relevance of that picture you're holding up to the jury either. Both those interactions between Mason and Maynard were very, very good and I'm really enjoying these trial scenes. They're not overdoing them. They're not making the show become a trial show. So I appreciate that, but I do appreciate the scenes in the courtroom. And of course, uh, these scenes in the courtroom showing that Mason is growing as an attorney, we also see in the courtroom during these scenes his future foe, uh, Hamilton Berger, who we find out this episode during a scene with Della is a gay man. So both Della and uh, Hamilton Berger are closeted, which came out in a kind of amusing way during their interaction at a restaurant where uh, Hamilton refers to Della as his fiance, which I presume is just a joke he's making, but uh, maybe they are going to get engaged to cover up their... Uh, actual orientation. I'm not really sure uh, what the implication was there. Obviously, this episode we saw Mason getting closer and closer to the truth of what happened with the Dodson child in no small part thanks to Paul Drake's investigative efforts as he finds out the hotel where the Dodson baby was held and helps Mason to track down the body of the um, prostitute who was used as a nursemaid for the child while they were keeping him at the hotel. And Mason was very, very uh, smart this episode in his deductive reasoning, the way he deduced what had happened, why the Dodson baby had died. And this clears up a big uh, sticking point for the series, which was why did the Dodson baby die? Why did they kill the Dodson baby? And it turns out that the killing was not intentional, that the baby died because he had nursed at the breasts of this woman who was an addict. And of course, this woman ended up dead because Ennis is clearing the house. As he hinted last episode in his conversation with his partner, he's going to go finish off the people who could potentially uh, cause him to come to justice. So he killed this uh, Asian prostitute in a previous episode, I assume, and now he, this episode, uh, kills the financial uh, manager from the church who uh, Strickland was trying to follow but lost during the rally. And it was a very, very brutal slaying. He stabbed him, I think, like 40 times, 50 times. Are you dead yet? Whack, whack, whack. I was a uh, kind of surprised how long it went on but then I remembered the first episode of this show and realized this show really is very bloodthirsty when it gets the chance to be but thankfully and I'm not saying I'm opposed to a good old fashioned violent slaying but I feel that I'm glad to see this show not relying on it overly I'm glad that it is not relying on these murderous moments of mayhem it's relying more on the characters and the humor in the development of the story, which I think will give it more longevity than something that's relying on shocking moments. And this moment, of course, isn't a huge moment, but it does mean that there's fewer and fewer people who are going to be able to help Mason make his case. And of course, Mason is setting the stage to put Ennis on the stand next episode. But the last thing of importance that happened this episode, and this is probably something that stood out in a lot of people's mind as one of the more interesting moments, is we've all been speculating what was actually going on with Sister Alice and her mother. And this episode opens with the revelation that her mother had used her daughter as uh, a prostitute, in a sense, to get them gas to go to a destination at one point. And... This revelation kind of really colors the way we see this relationship between Bertie and her daughter. And it also affects our understanding of their 
earnestness as far as religion goes because, of course, not saying that religious people never do bad things, but of course they've cast themselves as pious religious figures when they have a past that if it ever came out, in keeping with the show's themes, could really ruin them. And this episode, their opposition from the church members who uh, are affronted by Alice's claims to be able to raise the gods and Baini from the dead uh, come to a head when they break into the studio while she's filming a religious uh, sermon and show that the man that she healed healed last episode actually wasn't healed at all, that he was only able to stay out of his wheelchair for a couple hours before he could no longer walk once more, which was what I theorized was going on. Some of you thought that there might be some kind of a con going on with this man, but I really just suspected that this was a portrayal of what oftentimes happens with uh, religious um, televangelists and others these days. When they heal people, they get them into a frenzy, they think they've been healed, but there's no lasting healing because there really wasn't any supernatural uh, aspect at work at all. And, of course, this sets things to a head for their final confrontation as they go to the cemetery to raise the Dodson baby. And this was a tense little scene because, obviously, there were concerns that uh, Emily Dodson would not be safe in this situation. We've seen indications this whole episode that the funeral or the scene at the cemetery could explode into violence, Perry getting the garbage tossed on him outside the courtroom steps, uh, the scene in the courtroom where the people from the church break in and throw the smoke bomb. Uh, scenes such as this kind of hinted, okay, things could go in an explosive direction at this event where the baby is to be resurrected. But of course, the big trick is that Bertie was not about to let her daughter ruin their ministry by not being able to pull off this miracle. So she apparently has the child, the child's body removed from the casket and had a different baby found in the street so that she could claim that a miracle had happened. Obviously, this is completely unverifiable, except that it's going to be obvious to anyone who looks at that baby that it's not the actual Dodson baby. And certainly, I wouldn't think that Emily Dodson would be fooled. But of course, uh, the funeral did explode into violence, and this was a really good scene how Perry and Della are obviously the only ones who truly care about Emily Dodson's well-being. And as we saw earlier this episode in the scene between Perry and Strickland, Perry really cares about Emily. He's passionately trying to protect her, and this scene finds him going into harm's way trying to protect her from the crowd and just barely succeeding. There were a couple times this scene was pretty tense. Uh, and you know, you know that it's probably gonna be okay because it is Perry Mason's show. He's not gonna die, but it definitely had a lot of tension in this scene. And Perry really took a beating this week between his beating at the pimp's hands uh, and at his beating at the cemetery. Uh, so he's really pretty durable as a uh, lead. And I just appreciated the camaraderie that Della and him shared as they were able to shepherd Emily out into the car, who clearly she's just given up. She doesn't care if she gets off or not. She was banking it all on the resurrection of her child, and perhaps she'll be fooled by this false, um, ch uh, this false Dodson baby because she wants to be, but we'll have to see next week. Uh, we left Sister Alice this week running away from her mother and just fleeing the scene of the false dods and baby's discovery. So it'll be interesting to see where next week goes. I'm really excited for the finale. I think this show is fantastic, and I really really expect that the finale will probably be the best episode i'm probably i'm kind of expecting it to be an extra long episode probably like an hour 20 or something as hbo tends to do for finales uh they've got a lot to fit in but the everything is set up for an awesome finale now i will say one minor criticism of this show the mystery has seemed to be rather obvious and even though 
the church's involvement was not obvious from the get-go. I think most people could have anticipated that based on the fact that the church was featured in the story at all. Based on the economy of characters, you would have to suspect that there was going to be something tying this murder back to the church. And I kind of suspect that if there is someone at the church who has involvement in the story besides the characters that we've already encountered, it's going to be someone pretty obvious, such as uh, Robert Patrick's character or um, Bertie McGeegan's. So let me know what you thought in the comments. If you're interested in seeing more reviews on this channel, please consider subscribing. And as always, you can watch more videos right now.